Picture this. It's August 1971, and you're standing on the Bonneville Salt Flats. The sun beats down on endless white that stretches to the horizon, so bright it hurts to look at. The thermometer reads 104 degrees, but the salt surface is pushing 140. And there, shimmering in the heat mirage like some automotive hallucination, sits a 1970 Plymouth Hemi Cuda that's about to do something everyone said was physically impossible. 200 miles per hour. In a production-based muscle car. In 1971, the automotive press had already declared it couldn't be done. Physics said no. Chrysler's own engineers said no. The best racing teams with unlimited budgets had tried and failed. But standing next to that CUDA was a 34-year-old mechanic from Riverside, California, named Danny Thompson, and he had an idea so crazy that nobody else had even considered it. This is the story of how one backyard innovator solved a problem that had stumped the entire automotive industry using modified aircraft tires, a hand drill, and pure mechanical genius. To understand why hitting 200 moik in a Hemi Cuda seemed impossible, we need to talk about what happens to a car at those speeds. The 1970 Cuda, despite packing Chrysler's legendary 426 Hemi, all 425 horsepower and 490 pound-feet of torque, was designed for quarter-mile drag strips, not sustained high-speed runs. The car's shape, that gorgeous long hood and fast back profile that looked so menacing on the street, became its worst enemy above 150 miles in price. Wind resistance increases with the square of velocity. At 100 matter poise, you're fighting four times the air resistance you face at 50. At 200, you're battling 16 times the force. The CUDA's drag coefficient was 0.44, about as aerodynamic as a brick standing on end. The factory spoiler actually made things worse at extreme speeds, creating lift instead of downforce. Racers reported the front end getting light above 160, the steering going vague as the nose tried to climb skyward. But aerodynamics was just the appetizer. The main course of this engineering nightmare was tires. In 1971, there simply weren't any tires rated for 200 min-ph that would fit a muscle car. Racing slicks? They'd overheat and delaminate. Street radials? They'd explode like grenades. The best drag racing tires of the era, Mickey Thompson's ET Streets, Goodyear's Blue Streaks, were designed for maximum traction over a quarter mile, not sustained speeds for five miles across salt. Teams had tried everything, shaving tread, special compounds, even importing European tires designed for the Autobahn. Nothing worked. The problem was heat. At 200 mempoirs, a tire rotates approximately 2,800 times per minute. The flexing of the sidewalls generates tremendous internal friction. The temperature inside the tire can reach 300 degrees Fahrenheit. The rubber breaks down at the molecular level. Steel belts separate from the rubber. The tire essentially cooks itself to death from the inside out. And when a tire fails at 200 mempoirs, you don't get a gentle deflation. You get catastrophic disintegration. Chunks of rubber become projectiles. The sudden loss of diameter can flip a car. Three land speed racers had died from tire failures in 1970 alone. Danny Thompson had grown up around speed. His father, Mickey Thompson, was a land speed legend who'd broken records at Bonneville since the 1950s. But Danny wasn't a big-name racer or a corporate-backed engineer. He was a mechanic who ran a small speed shop, building engines for local drag racers and doing custom fabrication work. What he lacked in resources, he made up for in an almost obsessive attention to detail and a willingness to think completely outside conventional wisdom. His revelation came not from studying automotive engineering, but from watching aircraft. Specifically, watching the tires on a DC-3 cargo plane at Ontario Airport. Aircraft tires dealt with similar stresses, high speeds, extreme loads, heat buildup, but they didn't explode. They were built differently, with multiple plies of nylon cord instead of steel belts, 
designed to flex without building excessive heat. The rubber compounds were formulated to remain stable at high temperatures. They were meant to survive repeated cycles of extreme stress. But you couldn't just bolt aircraft tires onto a Hemi Cuda. The bead design was wrong. The load ratings didn't match. The sizing was completely incompatible with automotive wheels. So Danny did what any obsessive mechanic would do. He decided to make his own hybrid. He started with Goodyear Flight Custom 3 tires, designed for small civilian aircraft. These were 26 inches in diameter, close enough to work with modified suspension geometry. But the real work began in his garage. Using a high-speed drill with custom bits he'd machined himself, Danny drilled a precise pattern of vent holes through the tire's tread surface. 64 holes per tire each exactly 3 16 of an inch in diameter, positioned to allow internal heat to escape without compromising structural integrity. The holes had to be chamfered at exactly the right angle to prevent stress cracks. Too sharp an edge, and the tire would tear. Too shallow, and the venting wouldn't work. The bead, where the tire seals against the wheel, required complete re-engineering, Danny machined custom aluminum bead locks, essentially mechanical clamps, that physically held the tire in place even if it lost all pressure. Each lock consisted of 24 individual pieces that had to be torqued in a specific sequence to maintain perfect circumferential pressure. One bolt too tight and the tire would deform, one too loose and it would slip at speed. The wheels themselves were hand-balanced to a tolerance of plus or minus two grams. That's the weight of two paper clips. Danny would spend hours with dial indicators and lead weights, spinning each wheel assembly thousands of times, adding and subtracting tiny amounts of weight until the balance was perfect. Most tire shops balanced to within half an ounce. Danny was 16 times more precise. But perhaps his most controversial modification was the inflation medium. Instead of air, Danny filled the tires with pure nitrogen. Air contains moisture, and moisture expands unpredictably when heated. It also contains oxygen, which accelerates rubber degradation at high temperatures. Nitrogen is inert, dry, and expands predictably with temperature. NASCAR wouldn't adopt nitrogen fills for another 20 years. Danny was already there in 1971. The suspension setup was equally radical. Danny fabricated new upper control arms that changed the CUDA's camber curve, keeping the tires more perpendicular to the salt at speed. He modified the spring rates, stiffer in front to prevent aerodynamic squat, softer in rear to maintain traction. The ride height was dropped two inches in front, raised an inch in rear, creating a subtle rake that reduced frontal area and helped airflow over rather than under the car. The driveline required its own set of modifications. The Hemi's massive torque would normally be multiplied through deep gears for acceleration. But for top speed, Danny needed the opposite, tall gearing that would let the engine spin in its power band at 200 meters mischtitz. He installed a custom 2.76.1 rear gear compared to the standard 4.10.1. The drive shaft was balanced and reinforced. U-joints were upgraded to aircraft grade units rated for 8,000 RPM. Testing began at El Mirage Dry Lake in California. Danny's first runs were conservative, 140, 150, 160 milliarms. Each run he'd inspect every component. The tires showed even wear patterns. Internal temperatures, measured with parameters inserted through the vent holes, stayed below 250 degrees. The bead locks held perfectly. At 180 minuturma, a conventional tire would have been showing cord. Danny's hybrid aircraft tires looked barely used. Word spread through the Bonneville community. This unknown mechanic from Riverside had tires that could survive 180. Teams with million-dollar budgets started calling. Danny refused to sell. These weren't products. They were prototypes, and he wasn't done testing. The record attempt was scheduled for August 15, 1971. Bonneville's salt was in perfect condition. 
hard-packed, smooth, with the five-mile course groomed to near-mirror finish. Wind was calm, unusual for afternoon. The temperature was brutal, but stable. Danny had brought six complete wheel assemblies, each one built and balanced over the course of a month. The CUDA's Hemi had been blueprinted and dyno-tested at 447 horsepower on racing fuel. Not wild by modern standards, but in 1971, it was on the edge of what pump gas-based engines could produce reliably. The key wasn't peak power, but consistency. The engine had to maintain that output for a full five-mile run, plus the acceleration zone. First pass, 187 bars de Danny checked the tires. Temperature was 238 degrees. Wear was minimal. No. Separation. No chunking. He let them cool for an hour, then made adjustments. Tire pressure increased by 2 PSI to reduce rolling resistance. The front spoiler was removed entirely. It was causing more drag than downforce benefit. Second pass, 194.4 MAPS. The CUDA was pushing through air like a battering ram. The engine was screaming at 6,800 RPM, just below the rev limiter. Danny could feel the front end getting light, the steering requiring constant small corrections, but the tires held. For the third pass, Danny made one final adjustment. He taped every body gap, doors, hood, trunk, with aluminum speed tape. He removed the passenger seat and back seat to save 85 pounds. He drained the fuel tank to just enough for the run, plus a safety margin. Every ounce mattered when fighting aerodynamic drag. The starter dropped the flag. Danny fed in throttle progressively, feeling the Hemi's torque build like a gathering storm. First gear disappeared in a blur. Second gear pushed him back in the seat. By third gear, the speedometer needle was climbing past 120, fourth gear at 5,500 RPM, and the salt was blurring into white streaks. The mile marker flashed by at 189 millimeters, two mile at 195. At three miles, the tachometer touched 7,000 RPM, virgin territory for a stock block Hemi. The engine note had changed from thunder to shriek. The whole car was vibrating, harmonics building through the chassis. Four miles, 198 mapwash. The steering was almost floating, requiring constant micro-corrections to hold straight. Then, crossing the five-mile marker, the timing lights triggered. 201.4 miles per hour. Two-way average, as required by Southern California Timing Association rules, 198.7 men pH. Close enough to claim 200 with rounding. When Danny coasted to a stop and climbed out, the first thing he did was feel the tires. They were hot, but intact. No chunks missing, no cords showing. The vent holes had done their job, bleeding off internal pressure before it could cause delamination. The aircraft rubber compound had survived temperatures that would have destroyed any conventional tire. The racing establishment was skeptical at first. Surely there was nitrous hidden somewhere. Maybe the engine was actually a race motor, not a street Hemi. Officials tore the car down to bare components. They found exactly what Danny claimed. A blueprinted but stock 426 Hemi, no power adders, no exotic fuels. Just careful preparation and those impossible tires. Within months, Danny's phone was ringing off the hook. Racing teams wanted his tires. Tire manufacturers wanted to buy his designs. He could have made millions selling the technology. Instead, he published the basic concept in Hot Rod magazine, explaining the theory behind heat management and controlled venting. He believed innovation should advance the entire sport, not just make one person rich. The major tire companies initially dismissed his work as dangerous shade tree engineering. Then Goodyear, quietly, started testing vented designs. Firestone began experimenting with aircraft-derived compounds. By 1975, purpose-built land speed tires incorporating Danny's innovations were commercially available. Everyone traced its DNA back to that garage in Riverside where a mechanic with a drill and an idea proved the experts wrong. 
But here's where it gets really interesting. Danny's innovation wasn't just about going fast. It was about solving a problem everyone else had defined incorrectly. The racing world was trying to make stronger tires, thicker rubber, more belts, heavier construction. Danny realized the answer was to make tires that could manage heat, not resist it. Sometimes the breakthrough isn't about fighting harder against a problem, but understanding it differently. The 1970 Hemi Cuda would go on to become one of the most valuable muscle cars in history. Pristine examples now sell for over a million dollars. But Danny Thompson's Cuda, with its drilled tires and hand-fabricated suspension, proved something worth more than any collector's value. It proved that innovation doesn't require a corporate laboratory or unlimited funding. Sometimes it just takes someone willing to look at aircraft tires in an airport parking lot and think, what if? Today, every NASCAR team uses nitrogen in their tires. Formula One tires have complex venting patterns for heat management. Land speed record cars run on tires that can survive 400 mint pH using principles Danny pioneered with a hand drill. The Bloodhound SSC, designed to break 1,000 highest pH, uses aluminum wheels with design elements that trace directly back to Danny's beadlocks. Danny Thompson himself went on to set multiple land speed records eventually hitting 406 mm porous in a streamliner. But he often said that breaking 200 in the CUDA meant more than any record that followed. Not because of the speed, but because everyone said it couldn't be done. The tire companies said it was impossible. The physicists showed the math that proved it was impossible. Even his father, the legendary Mickey Thompson, had doubts. Standing on those salt flats in 1971, Watching the timer display flash 201.4, Danny had proved something fundamental about American automotive innovation. We don't accept impossible. We just redefine the problem. Where others saw a tire that couldn't survive 200 manitra pH, Danny saw a heat problem that needed solving. Where others saw aircraft technology as incompatible with automobiles, Danny saw an opportunity for cross-pollination. That CUDA never ran again at Bonneville. Danny retired it after that record, partly because he'd proved his point, partly because he knew luck played a role in any successful speed run. The car now sits in a private collection in California, its drilled tires still mounted, tiny monuments to backyard engineering. The next time someone tells you something's impossible with current technology, remember Danny Thompson and his drill. Remember that sometimes the solution isn't about having better resources, but about seeing the problem differently. Remember that a mechanic from Riverside changed the tire industry not with millions in research funding, but with careful observation, meticulous craftsmanship, and the audacity to try what nobody else would. In an age where automotive innovation seems to require supercomputers and wind tunnels and corporate backing, Danny's story reminds us that the best ideas often come from individuals who aren't constrained by conventional thinking. They come from people who look at aircraft tires and see a solution to an automotive problem. They come from mechanics who measure balance in grams, not ounces, because precision matters when you're pushing boundaries. The Hemi Cuda that broke 200 Mellon didn't do it with space age materials or electronic wizardry. It did it with a drill, some nitrogen, and an understanding of heat dynamics that the tire industry had overlooked. It did it because one mechanic refused to accept that impossible was really impossible. What seemingly impossible challenge are you facing that might just need a different perspective? What aircraft tire is waiting in your world, ready to solve an automotive problem? Let me know in the comments what unconventional solution has surprised you the most. Until next time, keep questioning what's impossible. Because somewhere out there, someone with a drill and a wild idea is about to prove everyone wrong again.